All right, welcome back to another episode of Nostalgia Street, where we share the stories that shape us. I'm um, uh, here, as always, with my my business partner, buddy, uh, Vince. And today, Steve is our special guest. As always, we keep them uh, last nameless so that Vince gets a chance to uh, tease the crowd a little bit with a fun answer. See if you can, for those of you that listen to this on uh, on the podcast, you get to hear uh, Steve's voice. If you're watching the video, you probably already know who Steve is. But uh, with, with no further ado, let's, uh, let's find out what that interesting question from Vince is this week. So audience, let's welcome Steve into Forefront Studios today. And we're going to start off with one of our really fun questions. We know here that our guest today is an avid fan of the arcade. The yes. arcade experience, which doesn't quite exist nowadays Correct. as it did before. But let's say you could create a live action version of any arcade game. Ooh. What would it be? Galaga or Galaga. I'm not sure if I said that right. <laughs> no, I say Galaga. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And if you had to stake your life on it? Probably wouldn't live very long. <laughs> yeah. How many rounds would we make it through? <laughs> well, if I played today, not many, but back in the, back in the day, I probably would have made it pretty far. Yeah. So live. So I'm trying to pick, is this a movie uh, where we're shooting each other down? Probably. Yeah. Uh, if it's yeah. live action, sure. Yeah, you're in a spaceship yeah. and you're shooting aliens or whatever exactly. it is, right? Yeah. And, and that's where, uh, like, when you got to a certain level, then the, the guys would get together in groups of three and come down yes. and swarm at you? Exactly. They come, they split into groups of three and had to try to get the, the main one who's guarded by two other smaller ones or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a long time since I played a video game. A long so time. So, which one you remind me that maybe, you know, Steve, uh, th- uh, there was a Guardians of the Galaxy. Was it the second or the third one? Where it sounds like that, where they were, the the people were in gold. Yeah, and yeah. They the were, second one, they were like second, the, yeah, the yeah, virtual yeah. They fighters. Were, they, yeah, right. It was the gold people, and they were chasing them. <laughs> the yeah, gold yeah, people. yeah. That's what that reminds me of. Like if we could <laughs> jump in some virtual reality, it's very much like that. Absolutely. And yeah. go after that. So basically, we don't need another Top Gun movie. We need a Galaga movie. We do. I think that'd be a good idea. And no one's made one. something. Yeah, nobody's made one. With CGI nowadays, it shouldn't be that hard to make. No, not at all. And we can throw in some asteroids just for fun. There oh, yeah, go. there yeah, we go. Asteroids. It's, it can be a combo. Ast- asteroids <laughs> Galega movie. I like there that. There we go. Yeah. Oh, we just call it like Space Movie. Yeah. Space <laughs> Movie. <laughs> the Street invites you on a retro ride that's more than just a trip down memory lane. Uncover life lessons and personal growth stories that stem from our collective past. So you can live a richer, more connected life today. Whether you're a 90s kid, an 80s teen, or simply young at heart, you'll find something to relate to in each episode. Now, here are your hosts, Vince and Jeff. All right, so our guest today is Steve, Her- is it Haran? Haran, like Duran okay. Duran, Haran oh, Haran. Say it just like that. Very yeah. appropriate. All right, so Steve, I got to double check here. Steve is the assistant professor of business, and he's also the MBA director at USF. Yes. MBA standing stands for Masters in Business Administration. You got it. Dang, I'm so... <laughs> there I went go. to college for a little bit enough, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. So it's it's great to have you. We've we've known Steve for more than a few years. Yeah. Um, Steve's active with the uh, Disrupt HR yes. crew, um, Steve, which is a lot of fun to see people speak at that. Steve is also one of our five fans. Yes, I am. <laughs> our five. Fans. So I am fanboying right now. <laughs> yes, and autographs after when we're not on video. Yeah. Yes. So. So see, let's go. Let's go back in time. Yeah. Uh, when you were younger, did they call you Stevie, or just Steve? My sister did to annoy me, but yes. I never liked that. But right. you know how sisters are. Yeah. So exactly. I um, preferred Steve, and were, were of course, you... I get called Steven by your parents if you did something wrong. Of so, course. Yes. So, so paint us that picture of what growing up was like. Where did you grow up? Yeah. How was your family like? Yeah. Good. No. Good idea. I have a younger sister. So we're sixteen months apart. Um, she'll probably watch this. So I love you. But we'd never get get along, so yeah. it just kind of the way it was. Um, but we uh, were from the Aberdeen area, Okay. but we moved out to Rapid City. Um, I would have been in fifth grade, and so I did everything else out there in Rapid City. But um, no, it, it, good upbringing, solid upbringing, um, very thankful for my parents and the yeah. upbringing that I had. So were you ever uh, nicknamed Steve Majors? You know, I wasn't, but uh, the $6 million man was pretty popular. I remember getting some of the action figures yes. and all that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've never, ever recalled being called that. But yes, it's a, <laughs> you know, that little uh, that action figure where you could look through his eyes. Remember yeah. that? I had that. I had yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And you could roll back his sleeve. Yes. And you could see the little. You see the, the computer stuff on his arm or whatever. Stuff yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm pretending I understand what you guys are talking about. <laughs> 
Well, did you have a favorite episode? I probably watched them all, I yep. would imagine, back in the day, but I can't remember one over another. I don't know one. how many yeah. seasons there were. Is that but... the one where the guy gets his body replaced with like robot parts? Yes. yes. And he could run yeah. fast and then he'd run like to run slow. Like that was what kids would do. They'd run slow, like pretending they were running fast and the sound. Yeah. The sound effect that they would add. Okay. On the show. So yeah. he had, he had uh, vi- uh, bionic vision in one eye. Yep. He had, I think it was his right arm was bionic so he could lift stuff. And then he had bionic legs. So that he could run fast right. or jump high. Correct. And that was it, right? Those were the things he had That's going what on. I remember, yes. And then, uh, the, of course, the Bionic Woman, Lindsay Wagner, mm-hmm. she had, I think she had super hearing. All women do by default. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good, I mean. <laughs> so she had super duper hearing then. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. wife's going, I heard that. <laughs> exactly. Heard that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yeah, so those are good. I think the, the for me the the favorite episodes for Six Million Dollar Man were the ones with Bigfoot. Yes, played by I, remember a couple I think of those. it was Andre the Giant actually played. Could have been. Uh, I don't remember exactly, like, but yeah, yeah Bigfoot yeah. was a character in a TV show. Yeah, but Bigfoot's real. Like, would he just? I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't know this. You didn't, is this news to you? <laughs> <laughs> Who else is supposed to take? I feel on like the this gang up on Vince episode all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah, I'm gay. Like, would he just like walk by like he does in real life, or was he actually a character? No, he was. He well, he, he was in uh, maybe two or three episodes, okay. and, and they did fight. I remember them picking up big logs and swinging big logs at each other, and then by the end they made peace, just like King Kong and Godzilla. There's got to be some YouTube up. clips you could insert into the episode to show. I oh, think we totally will. <laughs> okay, we'll totally do <laughs> that. Six million dollars. And it's all off of Steve Majors. Yes, <laughs> he's writing it down. So, what were uh, what were some of those favorite activities besides pestering your sister that you did when you were? Oh, of course, that years? was rule number one: pester your sister. She pestered me back just as much as I pestered her, without a doubt. That <laughs> always happened. But you know, in where we grew up in the Black Hills, we were um, actually in a little town called Blackhawk, which is seven or eight miles outside of Rapid, between okay. Rapid City and Sturgis, and we had a. Uh, acreage up in the hills so um you could look up at the mountains you can see the roof of our house way up there in the trees and we had roughly an acre of uh, tr- of uh, trees and right next to us national forest so I spent a lot of time just uh, uh walking around and you know had bb gun you know the whole works you know Ooh. all that kind of stuff and uh, most of my friends weren't up there though, so I had to go back to town, you know, to hang out with my friends and stuff like that. Yeah. So, but uh, it was a lot of fun. No, it was a great place to grow up, and uh, the house is still there. Last time I was in Rapid, we drove just out of nostalgia, drove yeah. by it just to make sure it was there, and uh, it has this huge giant deck on the back, and that was still there that my dad and I built and all that. I, nice. I spent many a day put screwing screws into that thing <laughs> a long, long time ago. It's still there, thankfully. Um, but no, it was a great, t- good time, great, great place to grow up. When you go back, does everything look smaller? than you remember as a child of course Isn't it's just wild? always it always works that way yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. what about any wild animals were you ever attacked never was no did you see any? oh yeah absolutely there'd be deer we'd have deer in our yard um uh, squirrels you'd see raccoons no mountain uh, lions or never did see a mountain lion you know I, it's funny because i don't recall mountain lions ever being a thing when i was when i grew up out there i just huh. never do but now mm. they're everywhere my wife has an uncle who lives in the black hills too near johnson siding and um, they've got um, video of mountain lions in their yard. Um, Crazy. Yeah, that's wild. So, but that just don't recall that being a thing when I grew up out there. I'm not sure why it's different now, but yeah, they're everywhere now. Yeah. Did, did you ever get in trouble with that BB gun? Did I get in trouble with my BB gun? Yeah. No. So you, you only shot the things that you were supposed to shoot? Correct. <laughs> you, so <laughs> what I would do is, so here's what I would do. Get the little green army men. Mm-hmm. Yes, and like the plastic green army truck stuff like that, and that's that was those are my usually my targets. Yeah, so I nice. set them up and shoot them. Yeah, did that a lot. That's I just good. think it was at that Christmas movie. You'll shoot your eye out. Yeah. Well, you know <laughs> that never happened. Thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> I had a, it's, my BB gun was probably more of a pellet gun um, with air air pump. Like you could really you could really give it some some oomph if you wanted to if you put a little pellet in there versus a BB. You could shoot either one, but yeah, it was it had pretty good strength to it. So yeah. So if it wasn't your BB gun, what what uh, give us the circumstances of, of the worst time you got in trouble growing up? Oh boy, the thing is, I'm pretty compliant. So I don't. Re- <laughs> it, you, I, you guys have asked that before to other guests, and I was actually trying to think of that, and. I really have a hard time thinking of something. Wow. Um, probably just goofing off with my cousins, um, 
who grew up near us. So my dad and his brother each built a house. Yeah. So they, my uncle built their house closer to Sturgis, but also up in the hills. And then we built our house in Blackhawk. And so my cousins were roughly my age, boy, girl, cousins also. I can recall at least a couple of times just messing around with them and doing yeah. something you're not supposed to be doing, but I, I can't remember anything specific. All right. Um, so yeah. I. So I'm an accountant, so maybe I'm just compliant by nature. I'm, I'm <laughs> that makes sure sense. You wouldn't want that. That's a, it. Yeah. An no accountant risk. that gets, gets into trouble. That's you yeah. wouldn't want that. That's yeah, not, exactly. That's right. Business. So yeah. <laughs> so I saw, um, you know, as we've we've talked about on our show before, we we always give our guests a uh, kind of a questionnaire, so it lets us learn yeah. more about them. Also, kind of preps them for for the show. So Steve has the main folks that I loved to listen to. He's got down as his favorite groups, Def Leppard, Foreigner, Journey, Loverboy, and Night Ranger. Absolutely. So those are some great absolutely. groups. Absolutely. I've seen them all in concert, too. Have so, you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Who's your favorite? Def Leppard probably is number one. Yes. With uh, Journey, Foreigner, right in the neighborhood, too. Can you can you name the the uh, the band members? See, I was prepared for that. Joel, <laughs> Joe Elliott, wow. for yes. sure. Yep. Um, is, um, but after that, I'm going to struggle. So, yeah. Which band wins in a fight? Which band wins in a fight? Mm-hmm. Oh, Def Leppard. I mean, even though the the uh, drummers won one arm, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> he still take a one arm drummer from Def Leppard take, take out off. anybody else with two arms. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. I think, yeah, the drummer's first name is Rick. Yeah. I don't remember his last name. I don't either. Phil Collin, yeah, I think there you is go. Phil the Collins, guitarist. Remember. Yep, correct. Um, but we've talked about this, I think, a couple times. I saw some videos recently of uh, Def Leppard and. Poor Joe Elliott looks like a gray-haired ant. You know, it's funny. You get these 80s guys who, in their prime in the 80s, looked awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. They look like grandmothers now, right? right? Because they got the long gray hair. Like, they don't (laughs) cut the hair to be more age-appropriate. They let it go, and they're just kind of wrinkled, and the tattoos don't look the same as they did when they were in their 20s, and yeah. The the falsettos, (laughs) don't they don't play out so well. Exactly. Um, I'm going to give a plug for something that Def Leppard did a year ago. Oh, yeah. And so they actually released a new album a year ago, but oh, it wow. was a remake of everything they'd already done, but it was set to symphony music. It's called oh. Drastic Symphonies with the uh, London oh. Philharmonic. All right. Highly recommend it. You can just go to YouTube and uh, listen to most of it, but oh, really, really good stuff. I really enjoyed it. They've got this uh, version of Pour Some Sugar On Me. Yeah. You know, the, the the one that they really do is, you know, very fast paced and you really, you have a hard time, what are the word, what are they saying? You right, have to look right. at the lyrics. This one's very slow. Uh, and it's a duet with a female. And it's completely different, but it's 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 so, eerily good. So I would just say right. and then you hear the lyrics, you're like, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's what this song's about. Oh, okay. Now I know. <laughs> You've got stories about that. <laughs> I thought Pour Some Sugar and Me was about Kool-Aid. I did too. <laughs> I thought this was a song about Kool-Aid. I never knew it was something else. And we think today's kids are listening to sketchy music. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's like, oh, I guess I never really did listen to lyrics. <laughs> so uh, do you remember the, the lead singer for Night Ranger? Do you know his name? Um, I don't. And I just saw them. They were in Sioux Falls in December. Oh, out, were they? Out really? at the Military Alliance. And it was a great oh. show. Oh, my. That was an awesome show. And I don't remember his name. I think it was Jack Blades. Okay. And, I think. And it was the original. They had, um, I want to say, three of the originals were there. The drummer, the, the drummer's the one who sings Sister Christian and wrote it. Oh, yeah. He was there. and But I think three of the guys that were there originals, maybe four. Yeah. So I saw them in concert at some kind of like street event at uh, in Deadwood. Okay, yeah. And I forget who was on stage. And I just happened to be, I don't know if I knew the organizers or what, but I was right by the side of the stage. Yeah. And I'm just like looking around kind of behind the scenes, see what's going on. And and here's Night Ranger and Jack Blades, who's very short. Yeah, he was uh, he was stretching thoroughly, and I'm just you know fanboying a little yeah. bit. Like yeah. there's a guy that I literally grew up with exactly. listening to some of the best songs, and so he caught me, and he walked over, yeah. and then he started stretching a little bit closer to me, 
And uh, he goes, hey, at our age, we got to do this, right? I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. He goes, hey, when I get up on stage, he goes, I, that's where I got to throw the cane away. And, and uh, there you go. I got to. So it just cracked me up just to. I mean, usually, you know, people are like, hey, sign whatever. But then they come over and they want to talk to you. Yeah. And anyway, that was kind of fun. I thought you were going to say he was going to ask you to help him stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Can you push a little bit over here? Yeah. <laughs> Put your hand on my hamstring. There you go. <laughs> I, oh. yeah, I never watched the hand since I touched him either. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. This hand did touch John Bon Jovi. Oh, my. When I was Is in college, right? uh, they were, the whole band was coming out and, uh, yeah, so I high fived him, and he he grabbed my hand like like a here Vince, give me like a kind of like a high five, but then it went like this, or yeah. or maybe like this, yeah. And it felt like an hour, like. <laughs> and then I remember turning to my buddy, I'm like, dude, that's John Bon Jovi. He's like, I know, you would let go of his hand. I'm like, no, no, he would let go of my hand. <laughs> so was it just easier or more accessible to see concerts back in the day? You know, I probably go to way more concerts now than I did back okay. then. Um, although, you got more money. I, I have <laughs> way more disposable income than I did in high school and college, without a doubt. You know, Rapid City has a really good venue. They just replaced it, but they had a really good venue, so they would get uh, you know the big concerts. But um, I honestly didn't go to that many. I go to way more now. So if there's any '80s band that's genuine in the neighborhood, um, you know, an hour or two hours away, um, I generally try to go. Did you get to see Heart? Of course, this was a couple years back. No, I didn't. So there was a time period, <laughs> a four-year stretch where I didn't do a lot. So yeah. I finished up my doctorate a year ago, oh, wow. spring of 23. And there was about a four-year window right there where that was the main thing of my life. So I did do a few fun things. Yeah. But um, if it was, you know, if I didn't know if I had the time, I would say no. So, um, but otherwise yeah so i'm kind of making up for that now the last yeah, yeah. year i've gone to about anything i can go to that's yeah. in the neighborhood so who's like the who are the current favorites that you you like to listen to or yeah. that you would go to a concert um, for you know it's funny i don't have spotify i have um sirius radio yeah. and oh. i stream it in my office or my home or my phone and so i almost always have it between channel eight which is 80s on eight and Channel 25, which is Classic Rewind, and a few others in between. There's yeah. a New Wave station, a hairband station, Classic Vinyl, and a few others. So I'm just, I'm a, I'm a flipper. So if yeah, I'm in yeah. my truck, just driving around, I just, you just tap the button and, and switch to the next station. In my office, I do that too sometimes, just depending on what I'm, what I'm focused on. So, so um, I don't listen to CDs much anymore like I used to or anything right, like right. that, because I just do that. But I've seen Journey now twice in the last year. They were in Sioux City, Back on February 28th, okay, hmm. they were in Sioux Falls March of a year ago. Same show, it was, yeah. they wrote Toto. They did the exact same set. Everything was the same, which is just fine by me. Yeah. Um, but it was a great show. And their nice. lead singer is Arnell. I don't forget his last name. Yeah, he's Filipino. He's Filipino. Right? He's our age. Is he really? He is our age, oh, and you would that. never know it by the way this guy moves. He clearly does stretch a lot. <laughs> boy, that guy people's is, helping him in the back. That guy is all over the place on that <laughs> stage. I did not all know. The, other, the original band members, they're just they're glued to where they are. Right? They're, okay, I'm not, I'm not moving. I got to this spot. I ain't moving. But yeah, Arnell is everywhere. That's cool. So, so what what is a what's a vague. 80s song like you're listening to the playlist and every once in a while you're like oh man i haven't heard that for a long time but i always love that is there a vague song oh, that's like a, that well that's a tough question that's a really i'd have to hear it to remember that because <laughs> like i would listen um, to a variety of stuff but i like i like the rock but i also like yeah I don't, the new agey so like yep. the fix adam ant yeah uh golden earring that's a good one all of these groups yeah. had these very like some of them were one hit wonders and some of them would, would hang in there and, and come up with a couple others. But once in a while, I'm like, wow, I have not heard that song, whatever that may be. I've got one. I've okay. got one. Dead Man's Party. Okay. I believe by Oingo Boingo. It is. Okay. Which was in the and movie. In the movie was? Weird Science. There you go. Yeah. yeah. The, so how about this? Yeah. It's three thousand years from Look now. At us. You got I gotta get some 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 words in here. <laughs> okay, so it's three thousand years from now, humanity is long gone from Earth, and either future humans or aliens or whoever dig on Earth and they find one record. What is the record that you hope they find? 
I, ironically, don't stop believing would be kind of funny because <laughs> we're gone. <laughs> we're not around. <laughs> and that's a pretty popular one. What do you think? What do you think? Because <sighs> this, this record will set the trend. They'll think that humans, this is a human culture. Okay. See, like, I'm emblazoned with uh, pyromania. Yeah, I was just thinking something from Def Leppard. I was thinking Photograph by Def Leppard. Yeah, um, which was on that album. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But that was an iconic album cover with, a, it's like a, like you're looking through a telescope and there's a building that's on fire. Yes. And I remember using that image when I was in computer programming, I was trying to replicate that graphic mm. image on a computer. Very nice. And that was just one of my, I don't know, that, let's see, Rock of Ages. Yep. Die Hard the Hunter, of course, uh, Photograph. That was their, their big That was the break, big one, I think. Yeah. Didn't they etch some of these onto the Voyager when they sent it off into space? Like, they literally, like, they etched some... That sounds right. Really? Yeah. They, that sounds right. I think I maybe recall hearing that. Because part of Voyager had these golden discs that were supposed to tell, like, whoever encounters it, human culture. And so when they sent off Voyager, they put music and they put a bunch of other things that they could... Whatever they could etch with whatever they'd use to make vinyl back in the day. Yeah. yeah. We'll be right back. So let's switch to uh, to movies and, and yeah. TV shows. What were some of those hardcore shows or movies that you liked that sure. still resonate today? Sure. A-Team. Da, da, da. The original Battlestar Galactica. Not yes. the new one, but the original one. Yeah, Although yeah. it was really cheesy, but I, I liked it. it was yep. Six Million Dollar Man. That's more yep. in the 70s than it sure. was the 80s. A Cheers was yep. a good one. Cosby Show, which you wouldn't want to watch anymore, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer. Um, yeah, just a disclaimer on that one. Um, <laughs> those are some of the ones I remember um, the most. Movies-wise, you know what's funny about, like, um, so for, for me, one of my most favorite movies ever um, would be Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. Because it came out a year after I graduated high school. So I graduated high school in 85. So I went to college right away, did college for four years. So I come back the next summer, go back to Rapid City for my, for my first summer back. And that was a, you know, that movie came out and it just spoke to me, right? I mean, it's just yeah. like, that was just, what a great movie about somebody's graduating high school and thinking about the future in college. And I have probably seen that movie in the theater at least 20 times. Um, so I went to college in Northern State and then my roommate, so um, they used that movie as a fundraiser for something. <laughs> and so it, it played like every night uh, for a week in, mm -hmm. in one of the theaters in Aberdeen. And so him and I went every single night because it was yeah. a fundraiser for something. Like we're supporting a cause where we're having sure. fun too. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, but I've seen it so many times. I've got the DVD and if it's, it's kind of one of those things if you, uh, I still have cable, I guess I'm that old. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do like to channel flip sometimes. So if I do happen to see it, it's like, okay, your old bets are off. We're watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off right now. So, have you, uh, have, so now jumping forward, have yeah. you seen uh, Succession on HBO? Yes, I have. So obviously yes. Cameron from yes. Ferris Bueller Fry. Yeah. is, uh, I forget the name of the character that he plays in Succession. Connor but... Roy. Yes, Connor, yeah. who wants to be president. Yes. But he's not he fit had 1%. for that. Yeah, that's 1%. right. 1%. Um, 100 million dollars will get me 1%. <laughs> All right. So if you've seen this movie 20 plus times, what's your rent-free quote? My rent-free quote? Oh. It lives rent-free in your head. Oh, it lives wet free. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's that little song that Cameron um, sings to himself when he's in bed. When Cameron was in Egypt land, let my, my people, people go. go. That's, yeah. I think of that all the time. I don't know why. When Cameron was in Egypt's land, let my Cameron go. Steve and I like on the same <laughs> wavelength here because that's that's where I remember. You think about all the different things that happened in there. Of course, there's the parade at the end, but yeah, it was Cameron. And of course, the the car that Ferris crashes yes. and everything. But yeah, Cameron because he did not have like between that and Succession. I suppose he was in some stuff, but not a lot. I think of he stuff had a TV all. show he was on. He was in the movie Twister. He had a small part in that. If oh, you that's remember, right. um, that's right. But never uh, the iconic role necessarily. Right. It kind of remembers somebody for yeah. you know, like Matthew Broderick was obviously in a lot of things. Right. Um, so yeah, he didn't have quite the same career. But um, um, something I, I always think about with Ferris Bueller's Day Off is, if I if I remember right, that was one of the first movies where 
kind of the credits played while there was still stuff going on. Mm. At the very end, mm, we had yeah. Ferris getting out of the shower saying, it's over. <laughs> yeah. Go home. Yeah. You know, and I don't recall a movie ever really doing that That's before. That's true. Which nowadays is pretty common, especially with Marvel movies. Yep. So I was, because I think I might have missed that the first time I, that I, I saw the movie. Right. And so Buddy said, did you see the end part? I'm like, what are you talking about? So we had to go back again, right? Okay, yeah. We got to watch the very end now yeah. of this movie after the credits. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And that makes me think about War Games, which I think yes, was Broderick's first Yes, that's a really movie. good one. That's a Do good you want one. to play a game? Yeah. yeah. I was trying to explain <laughs> to, to Vince the, you know, the, the different size discs, but even in that movie, I think those were the bigger, the bigger floppy discs that were eight, like eight inches maybe. And then it went to five and a quarter. Five and a quarter. And then it and was then three, three inch ones. Yeah. yeah. So this, the ironically, the save icon that we see on any software is the three inch disc. And I like to explain it to my undergrad students. They look at me like, "Okay, Grandpa." To, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. We heard that. We heard from other guests that today's kids think that's a fridge. That's a what? They think it's a fridge. <laughs> fridge. It's a fridge icon. Like you, you save it. You like you put it in the refrigerator. <laughs> I know that I have a three and a half inch disc somewhere in my home office. I should just dig one out and bring it to school some days, show my students. This is the save icon. Yep. Yep. That's so cool. You have it printed out. <laughs> I 3D printed my save icon. Okay. Yeah. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. We've never done this before on the okay. show. That's not a real pen. Um, it's oh, not shoot, a real pen. That, okay, quick. Okay, give me your, give me your, uh, this. Oh, he's got a pen. I always have, okay. accountants always have a pen in their pocket. All right. So we know that um, Steve, as he was growing up, <laughs> He said that he had an Apple Mac, and you played games with the floppy drives. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to show this events. So tell us your top three games that you remember playing on that Apple. The one for sure, it was about Olympics. And so you chose a character. Okay. And Don't look. Uh, okay. And... <laughs> Um, you got to be like you'd be a Russian character, American, whatever. I don't okay. remember exactly, I but that. and it was and this Mac had green screen, so it was green background, <coughs> yeah, and the little cursor was one color, okay. and the floppy disk, and you could put two. This one was fancy; it had two floppy two. disks. You I put two that. of them in there. One was the operating system. One was to save your stuff. And so um, okay. we, my friends and I played that all the time. Okay. That's the one I remember the most. All right, keep going. Yeah. Let's give, give us two more. Two more. Um, I don't recall. That's. I'm, did I write it down in my thing? Magic trick right now. I yeah. thought I had it figured out. Okay. Because the one that I played, I would go. We we couldn't afford computers when we were kids. So we did you just... do your homework on the back of a shovel with coal? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. I knew it. I was pretty pretty sure about that. <laughs> no, we would go shovel. to the we would go to the Apple store in town. It wasn't an Apple store, but they sold apples. But Choplifter. The grocery store. Oh, I do remember Choplifter now that you say it. Yeah, absolutely. I remember Choplifter. You ever, you ever seen Choplifter before? Is that like a helicopter? It's a helicopter, and I think it's like you're helping ki uh, You're helping save... Uh, Are you rescuing people? something? Yeah, you're rescuing people from a village. Yeah. Or Are you like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Get in the chopper! Yeah. You was kind of, <laughs> the chopper. You would, you would have to, you'd have to land and pick up as many as you could. And I think you could only hold like 15, and you'd have to take them, pick them up, and take them back to headquarters. But on the way, there would be things that would shoot at you. Always things shooting at you. And then once in a while, you'd have to leave somebody abandoned as the chop would take off and leave the poor guy behind. It was uh, traumatic. Still dream about it. <laughs> <laughs> so when we asked you if you had done any activities in, in during your high school period, you just put Kmart. I did. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I worked a lot. I didn't. I had a small group of friends, and all my friends, like I was never in the band, but all my friends were in the band. Is I don't know how, why that was. You got, you got, uh, you broke the seal, and you got into the band camp. Yeah, kids. right. I, but I was, I wow. have zero musical skills, cannot play a thing. It was just never something I was ever interested in, and I didn't do a lot of extracurriculars. Um, but I worked a lot. Yeah. So my uncle on uh, worked at as a manager at Kmart and Rapid. And so that was one of my first jobs, and I just really enjoyed it. I really yeah. liked it. As, as silly as that might sound, um, I really, really enjoyed working there a lot. I learned a lot about business. Um, sure. I got to see all kinds of different parts of the business, and um, as silly as that might seem, obviously they failed, so <laughs> there's a lesson <laughs> learned there. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I worked a lot of hours, got to know some really good people there, some people that mentored me, some of the managers, uh, learned a lot of life lessons, business yeah. lessons from them. 
Um, and I was always interested in business and accounting. That's I was weird that way, I guess. But um, but yeah, so I, I just worked a lot. I worked as many hours as they would let me work. Yeah. And that was like the original big box store. Yep, absolutely. I, mean, I guess J.C. Penney kind of, but but yeah, most towns typically had a Kmart. And that's before Walmart. Yep. Or, I think. Walmart ultimately knocked them out. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I but, did. So you get paid when I worked at Kmart. You got paid every Friday in cash. Really? Wow. Seriously. Whoa. Every Friday in cash, you got paid. Wow. That was a big deal when you're a teenager. Yeah, it would keep you coming so back. So I worked there in high school and college both. Oh. I was there for huh. probably seven years between the one in Rapid City and the one in Aberdeen. And what was the, uh, was it a red vest? What was the? Blue light special was I mean, the yep. thing. I remember that. Um, I don't remember ever wearing a vest, though. I thought it was red. The red was our color, though. Yeah. Do you know Came, the Kmart special? logo was red. I remember the blue light special. Okay. I mean, we'll find the blue light. That's what's on sale. That's right. Yeah. So what would they... I, help me remember that memory. They would just say, now in our floral department or whatever. Somebody like that. would get on the loudspeaker, you know, talk over the intercom. They'd have this little cart with the blue light on it. Yeah, I remember that. They'd park it by something or some <laughs> department. And you had a, you had a sticker gun, because that was before barcodes. Yeah. And so something was on special for a short amount of time, and you'd announce for the next five minutes or whatever it was. Yep. If you come over here, you can buy this thing at this price off. And people would come over, you had to put a sticker on it. So um, I had to actually call a few of those out, but I would often be the, the person with the sticker gun. Yeah. It's okay, just make sure everybody gets their price because there was no barcodes back then. So that's power. <laughs> so you I'm, could give your friends an extra discount. There you go, right? Here's yeah. 10 cents off, Jim. I remember that. I, was like, I think Kmart was a place that had like the little like um, snack area. Yeah, absolutely. The, the sub sandwiches, like in up front, the kind of small deli area, and some of them had a more of a cafeteria in the back too. Yeah. And my favorite drink there was the Slurpy. icy. Icy. Cherry. I remember one year there, one Christmas time year, and I bet it was probably, my guess would be 85, um, Cabbage Patch Dolls being a really big deal, right? Yep. The shortage of Cabbage Patch Dolls right yeah. there. Yeah. And so uh, basically I remember there on a Sunday night, um, if you showed up, you could register yourself to to get one, basically for the right to buy it at full price. It wasn't giving them away. Wow. We only had so many. Um, I don't remember what the number was. Um, and so I was there that night to help out with it. We were not normally open on Sunday nights back then. That was when life was simpler. <laughs> you weren't yeah. open Sunday nights, but we were for that. And it was a big deal. We. Um, we had the cafeteria area. We cleaned that. That wasn't open. We put them all in that area because we could kind of block it off. And so basically it was a, it was a huge crowd. And you had to come in there and you would you know register, okay, I want to buy one. And then we drew. There was like 50 of them. It wasn't that many. And then you got to buy it. And it was, it was weird. It yeah. was a strange experience just to see that craze of the Beanie Baby thing happening in real yeah. life. Or I said Beanie Baby, Cabbage, Cabbage Patch Dolls. Yeah. Um, Beanie Babies was more in the 90s. Um, but to see that was wow. really strange. And there's there's documentaries out there about that. There's YouTube videos about that. But I actually saw that. I was a part mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. So before people stood in line for iPhones, they stood in line for Cabbage Patch Dolls. Correct. Yeah. yeah. They were a really big deal for, that's a, wild. Yeah, for a while there. They, it took so long to make them. I think they were probably making them overseas. And so to get them to to the U.S. and get distributed took a long time. And it only, you only have so much time in the Christmas season. So, yeah. I feel like you should be writing a book. Everything I learned in life, I learned in a Kmart. <laughs> I don't think anybody would buy that because nowadays people go, didn't that fail? Or they go, what's a Kmart, right? My, my 19, 20 year old undergrads would be like, what's a Kmart? Like, yeah. Actually, I have asked them, do you guys remember Kmart? And so far, the answer has been yes. There's enough of them around um, and they closed recently enough that most remember them at least. But okay. there'll be a generation here in a few years where they're going to go, what? What's that? I don't know what that is. I have the question of the year. Yeah. Yeah. What does the K stand for? In oh, yeah. what what Kresge. Is that right? It's like the name of the That's person. The family's name. Kresge? Yeah. Kresge. Oh. I never, never Walmart. knew Why that. Is it I never called Walmart? asked that. Sam yeah. Walton, right? Sure. Same I never thing. thought about asking that question growing up. But yeah. 
as we're talking to today, Steve. Like, Wait a second, it's got to be something. Today we learned, Jeff. <laughs> today we learned. Kresky Mart. Now we know. <laughs> Kresky Mart wouldn't have the same ring as Kmart would have. I feel like I can check some stuff off on my bucket list just knowing that. <laughs> Well, look at our time. Like, this, this, we're like way behind schedule. On the we just had a lot of fun talking about the regular stuff. Yeah, we we did. Know, we're with our super fan. Super fan. It's a good episode. Fanboying. So, what? Uh, so, you where, where did you go to college at? Northern State up in Aberdeen. Okay. Yep. My um, both sides of my family originally from the Aberdeen area, and so um, my folks went both went to Northern. And so it was kind of implied that I should go there. Sure. And I really didn't have a reason not to. Um, and I kind of liked going there because um, I was able to kind of go back home. We, growing up, we moved out to Rapid, but we went back to Aberdeen all the time because both sides of my family, you know, grandparents, aunts and uncles were still there. So for me to go back to college there, my grandmother, um, she said, if you come back to sc school at Northern, I'll do your laundry for you. Oh. I'll probably cook you a dinner on the weekends. I'm like, deal, Grandma. Deal. Like, sign me up for that. <laughs> so, yeah, sign me up for that. So <laughs> so while I was pretty far from home, you know, it's about five and a half hour drive, whatever. Um, it, it felt like home to be in Aberdeen. And, yeah. and not many of my classmates went there uh, my first two years. Not a single one of my classmates I graduated with went to Northern. My last two years, um, a couple of guys that I knew pretty well, they went to um, Tech, uh, School of Mines, uh, did their general gen ed stuff. They want to be teachers, but they only do two years at School of Mines, and they did the rest at Northern. So it was great to have them there. We, we hung out a lot once they got there in their junior and senior year. Yeah. Huh. We'll be right back. So where did you, um, when you graduated then, where, where are some of the places that you hung your hat? When I graduated, uh -huh. yeah. So my first job was in Omaha, Mutual of Omaha, the oh, Wild Kingdom. Yeah. Right. So uh, here I go for living in Aberdeen, a city about twenty-five thousand. Met my wife there. We got married. Graduated May of eighty-nine. We got married in June of eighty-nine. Moved down to Omaha July of eighty-nine. And her brother was down there, so her brother was quite a few years older in his family. And so he was like, "Come down here if you guys are looking for something. I'll bet you find something down here." So they offered to have us come down for a weekend and. I did quite a bit of job searching and I found something at Mutual of Omaha in accounting and did that. And we just kind of missed South Dakota. We missed yeah. um, our hometown and um, you know, be, uh, Rapid City, Aberdeen being home for me and her hometown, Sisseton, she grew up on a farm near there. And so it was, we were far, you know, we were far away. And um, Sioux Falls seemed like a really happy medium for us, mm -hmm. like um, two and a half hours to get to her farm from Sioux Falls four and a half to five hours to get to Rapid City for, from here. So um, yeah, so we came to um, Sioux Falls in 91 and have stayed here ever since and oh, yeah. don't plan to leave anytime soon. And then when did you start working for USF? I was there in 12. So my job, my other jobs in, in um, Sioux Falls, so my, after Mutual of Omaha, I came up to here in 91, I found a job also in insurance. So really exciting working in the insurance industry. It's a thrill a minute. Um, I just put somebody to sleep by saying insurance. So, <laughs> We've lost Sorry, our wake up now. Wake up now. <laughs> <laughs> so a company called Midland National Life, which is now called Samus Financial. So I worked for them for over 20 years. Wow. I also worked at CNA Surety here in town sure. for a couple of years. I was also at Lloyd Companies for a couple of years. And while I was um, at Salmon's, I uh, went back to school to get my master's back in 99. So the fall of 99, I got what I call the 10 year itch. I was 10 years out of school. I wanted to get my master's degree and, and USF was a good fit for me at the time and did that in the fall of 99 and already passed my CPA exam. So I had that behind me and uh, graduated from USF in, in the spring of 02. And I really loved the college experience. When I was at Northern, I was an RA for two years. I was student association president my senior year. I was in student government as a senator my junior year. I just really loved everything about the college experience. I lived on campus for all four years and just uh, really kind of found my place. I really enjoyed Northern. It was a good fit for me. Um, a smaller school, which is what I wanted also. Sure. Um, but it felt like home. It just, Aberdeen kind of just being our, my original hometown, I guess I might say. And so I just loved everything about the college experience. But you get married, you move, you got to start your career, you kind of put that stuff behind you. And when I went back and got my master's at USF, it kind of reignited that. It kind of reignited that my my love for the the college atmosphere academics 
you know, obviously a small school, smaller than Northern, um, yeah. just really found my stride yeah. there. I connected really well with a lot of my classmates, uh, the professors there, and it really got me excited about education. And, you know, I've been an accountant for a long time, and it's a long grind, January, February, March, and I, I don't miss it. I don't miss it one ounce, because I, <laughs> if I was in accounting, I would not be here right now <laughs> in March. We'd be doing this in the summer. Yeah. Um, and I just I just kind of burned out on it. I, I love Salmon's. All the companies I've worked for, awesome companies, great people that I've worked with, um, wonderful connections. Um, I have really, really good memories of every place I've worked. But at some point, you're just kind of like, I need something different, right? I'm, and both of you probably did the same thing when you mm-hmm. started your own business. And so for me, that college experience was something I really wanted to do. And when I got done with my master's, I had my MBA, my CPA. And I like, I really want to teach. I just really want to do that. And so in the insurance industry, so I said insurance, so wake up. Um, <laughs> yeah. is, there's a lot of designations you can get, uh, a whole bunch of them. And so I was working on those um, because I just, I'm kind of one of those guys who likes to learn things and just always be doing something like that. And so I began to be able to teach those at Salmon's when I was there. And I really enjoyed that. And okay, I'm like, okay, I I do enjoy this teaching thing. I think I could do it. And so there was a school in town called Colorado Technical University, CTU. Um, They closed shop. They're not physically here anymore. Um, But um, a buddy of mine, the guy that I knew was adjunct teaching there. And he's like, you should give it a try, and I can hook you up with somebody to interview. So we did that, they interviewed me, and it went really well. They're like, yeah, you can teach this class. So they, you know, here's all the materials, here's all the stuff, and you have about two weeks to figure it out, right? So, <laughs> but I figured yeah. it out, and I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. And so they just kept giving me classes, giving me classes, and they're at night, and that was kind of before online was a thing. Yeah. And I did that for three years, and then one night, my dean comes in after class, like at nine o'clock at night, and he goes, you ever thought about working here full-time? I'm like, what? He said, yeah, I think we could, we, we could bring on full-time if you want. I'm like, I'll talk about it. So literally the next day, he, uh, him, me, and HR, we meet in HR, they just literally just gave me an offer on the spot. Wow. Yeah, wow. and I'm like, well, that's less than I make now. I'm like, it is? Said, yeah. What do you want then? And I just gave I gave him a number, and they they said, okay, this easiest job interview I've had in my wow, life, and I wish they would have wow. asked for more. Um, and so I did that for several years. Really liked that, but you know, we kind of knew that uh, they were going to leave Sioux Falls and just kind of go more of an online model, which they did. And so I was able to land at USF, and thankfully, my some of the connections I had as a student there really helped me a lot. So yeah. the fall of twelve is when I jumped over to USF. Yeah, I really so enjoy it. Are you still teaching now? I am. Yep. So tell us the one of the more memorable student teacher interactions you've had, whether whether in class or <laughs> after class. That you... so keep in mind that the students we get at USF are pretty high caliber because nope, we are, are a private <clears throat> faith based school. Um, we're not cheap, unfortunately. I wish we could be cheaper, but this is not the way it works. Um, so you get a pretty motivated group of students, right? Yeah. I mean, they're like. They want to be here. A lot of them are student athletes, and uh, academics are really important for us. If you perform mm-hmm. poorly in the classroom, it, that will affect your ability to play your sport. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to use an example from CTU, which was a different, a whole different story, a whole different ball of wax. Okay. <laughs> so this is an email, and I wished I had the email because I still. So a lot of the folks that I taught with at Colorado Tech, um, I've been I can hire an adjunct professors at USF for the MBA program. So I've hired several of them to teach in our MBA program at USF. And so, and because they were high quality, high caliber folks. And so I see them all the time. We, we reminisce about stories. And so one of them was an email that I received from a student back at my CTU days. And so he missed class that day. Um, and the way they did classes was you just met one day a week for three hours. So basically a class would be like eight to 11 and you okay. just met the one time. And so he emails me at some point that later that day and explaining why he missed class. Well, he missed class because he was sleeping on the couch of his girlfriend's apartment and his phone battery had died. He set his alarm on his phone, but he wasn't sure if it was gonna make it through the night. So he, set, he got a, a backup alarm clock, set that, but so his phone did die. But unfortunately, his girlfriend's rabbit chewed the cord of the alarm clock, so therefore the (laughs) alarm clock never did go off, and therefore he missed class. Wow. 
how much truth is in that, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. Frame that one. So he blamed the rabbit. And I do always think, though, if it was plugged in and the rabbit chewed the cord, would we have fried rabbit? Right. Because you think of uh, National Lampoon's vacation <laughs> yeah. and the cat was eating the Christmas yeah. lights. And <laughs> Silly rabbit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if that's. I don't know how much truth was in that. Jeez. You know, you you uh, you learn to have a high high level of skepticism when you receive things from you, from your students, and even when they tell you something in person, you're just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I I've gotten to the point where if you can't be here, just let me know, um, and I really don't want to know why because I've had. I've had female students in the past give me specific reasons why they missed class. I'm like, yeah. ah, TMI. <laughs> Please don't ever tell me that again. Um, yeah. So <laughs> well, I've always heard it said that when you make an excuse, the more detail you give, that usually means it's a stinking pile of BS. I would assume that's true. Yes, absolutely. Like the, the rabbit chewing the cord. You know, if, it, if I have a student who's almost always there, you know, participates in class, is a good kid, and they miss without explanation you know i i'm gonna go with probably something happened they couldn't control right yeah. i mean that's usually the case and i've had students admit to me i just uh we could go i apologize in this class today i i literally overslept i really apologize for doing that i said hey I, hey thanks for owning up to that i really yeah. appreciate that it tells me a lot about your character that you would tell me that so yeah. did you uh did you review a paper and and get blown away with what students came up with in a good way. In a good way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Or the bad way. Or the other way. Oh, the bad way too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the worst days of your job as a professor is, is when you know somebody plagiarized, right? Mm. You just know this is not their work. And yeah. they turn in something, you're like, you have never written to this quality ever in yeah. my class. And look at this paper. This is a work of art, right? <laughs> you're just like, ah, because you got to deal with it. You got to confront them. And mm -hmm. it just, uh, it's the worst part of my job. Yeah. How does that work nowadays? Because back then, you know, it used to be you cite your papers. Yep. That was a thing. But now, even like a five year old source is too old. And now oh. you've got AI. 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 Oh, yeah. AI has added a whole level of complexity to it. Um, the best you can do with AI is. Again, you look for the tone and you look for certain words that don't kind of make sense based on the context because AI might not be that smart to figure that out yet. It probably will be someday. Um, and I have not run against that yet, thankfully. I have not. Um, now, what educators have to come to grips with is AI is going to be a part of our lives forever. Okay. And there has to be legitimate business reasons to use AI, right? There, there just has to be. There has to be. Yeah. And because any business is all about quick efficiency, getting mm -hmm. things done as quick as we can. If AI can do this for me, let's, let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. So our students are going to graduate, go in the world, and they're going to, hey, we can use AI to do this. Let's use AI to come up with this pitch or uh, write this email or whatever it would be. And so students should be using it, right? But maybe it should be used more as a reference, right? Okay, I can give it a prompt see what I get from that, and use that to give me ideas that I can use for my own original writing. So that, right. to me, is really what AI should be used for at the moment, at least, mm -hmm. um, because I think we all should use it. Um, I have used it. I had to uh, deliver a speech last fall to the faculty and students uh, of USF, which is a pretty daunting thing. This sure. is a lot of people in a room. And uh, I had to do a five-minute talk, and I wasn't sure what to do. So I was... I was using AI to try to come up with something, and I didn't like a thing it came up with. It's probably the prompts I was giving it yeah. weren't that great. Yeah. But I actually, it, I just used it for a few ideas, and then I just went on my own. Um, so it helped me come up with some ideas to use as bullet points, but I had to fill in the bullet points with my own original thoughts. Um, so it was a place for it. I remember a, a class where the students, the very last assignment for the students was do what I call a review and reflect, basically, Tell me how the class went for you and your experience in the class. And it's just something that you can just regurgitate, right? Okay, here's mm -hmm. how it went for me. Blah, blah, blah. There's like three questions. Just answer the three questions. She used AI for it. And it, it very clearly. <laughs> I'm like, you couldn't give me your own original thoughts about the class? I was like, <laughs> yeah. really? You really like the one time we brought the elephant in? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It was so clearly written by AI. I was oh, just like, man. why'd you do that? And she didn't have a good, she, I was tired i deadline i'm like just 
please write it. I'll, I'll let you, I'm going to give you a grace here. Just please just write it as your voice. Yeah. Because I, I care about what you think, not what artificial intelligence thinks about this topic. Jeez. Right. So that was really frustrating to me that she did that. And a really good student too. So it was just like, ah. We'll be right back. So where do you where do you see whether it's whether it's AI or just like education in general? There's, I know there's a lot of people out there like you don't need a college education these days. It's really about you know just getting right into the workforce. Well, that's a challenge for us. Absolutely, um, college is expensive, and yeah. not everybody sees the benefit in it. And because unemployment is so low, it's not hard to get a meaningful job that pays well, right? And so we have seen in the Sioux Falls area, businesses that would have said a bachelor's degree is needed for this job, they're dropping it down to an associate's degree. And we're seeing that in the MBA numbers too, because if a business is gonna say, you don't have to have a bachelor's for this job, we'll, we'll take you with an associate's, they're not gonna turn around and require you to get a master's at some point in time, right? Mm -hmm. That's gonna kind of be more up to the student just to say, I, I think I just want that. And then it's probably on their own dime to pay for it. Because a lot of businesses, thankfully, are willing to pay for a good chunk of tuition, especially uh, grad school tuition. Um, but that's been lowering as the economy is you know, tightening and whatnot. Businesses have been kind of ratcheting that back. But I used to have students come into me, working professionals, 30s, 40s, uh, they would tell me specifically why they're getting the MBA. Well, this guy got promoted as 10 years younger than me but because he has his MBA. That's what I was told. He got it because he's got his MBA. Yeah. So here I am, right? And I'm seeing less and less of that. So fewer businesses are putting that emphasis on the MBA now, unfortunately for us, I guess. There's a ton of competition for MBA, um, mm -hmm. so much competition. Um, Augie added theirs in 19, Dort just added one. You got the big national online schools. They're at, they've got like unlimited budgets to advertise apparently because you see their ads all the time and right. they're, they're advertising all the time. So we're competing with the world essentially um, when it comes to uh, MBA. So you have to kind of sell the what we're about, our brand, what we represent. Um, and that's hard to do sometimes because some people really view education like a commodity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go where it's gonna be the best price and I get done the fastest. And yeah. so it's hard to compete against that sometimes. Right, I'm gonna throw you a total curveball as we're mm. talking. I'm like, ooh, here's a good one. So with your vast educational experience and as an academic, let's shift this over to, you, you said that USF has a lot of student athletes. Yes. So whether it's for USF or for the much, much larger schools, what do you think the impact on education, what's going to happen with this uh, name image likeness where now we're oh, paying yeah. our students yeah. to play sports for us? What, what do you think is going to occur in the next five or 10 years in terms of, is that person actually going to gain an education or are they really just there to make some cash and they may not even make the pros right but they're just there to get whatever cash they can well you throw money at a 20 something what are they going to do with it they're going to go yeah i'll take it right yeah. i mean that's mm -hmm. now we're not really seeing that at the division two level it's a different ball of wax i think but i know at both sdsu and usd that there are students making good money yeah. doing sponsorships and all that kind of stuff um SDSU just had a grad fair, so we always go up to that. I didn't go, I, my uh, different person went up to represent MBA for us, but he was telling me that, and, he's a, and the person that went for us, um, he's our graduate admissions advisor, but he's a former basketball player for USF back in the day, so he's a big basketball fan. And he worked at SDSU, so he goes up there to represent us at this um, fair. And he, I, I talked to him the next day to see how, how it went. He's like, well, yeah, the, the entire basketball men's and women's teams were there because they were getting paid to be there. Like they were there to represent the school yep. and so that the nil stuff, the NIL stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it probably does affect those schools, but I'm sure where it's gonna be a really big challenge would be the, the power five schools, all the division one really big schools where yep. they're national names because I've seen just, I follow sports pretty closely and I, what I've seen is, you know, students have all the right to transfer whenever they want. Um, so you get kids who can transfer, and now you know in the back in the day they transfer because I'm going to be able to start with this team and they've got a great program. I'm going to get the degree that I want. But now it's all about what will they pay me if I go mm -hmm. there, right? Yeah. What sponsorships can I get? What alumni will give me something to play there? 
And so I think it's really changing, uh, especially I would say probably college football at the D1 level and college basketball yeah. at the D1 level. I, I think it was, uh, maybe it was last week, but I, I saw a recent interview they did with uh, Nick Saban having yep. retired from Alabama. Yep. And I wondered if, if the NIL was having something to do with that. And he said that, he, referencing his wife, I forget her name, but they would use, you know, as far as like new recruits, they would do whatever they could to help develop these kids. And I know the, the thing that, that Nick Saban is credited for as far as being a great coach is there's not any any secret sauce, but the word that they always use with Nick Saban is it's all about the process. It's mm-hmm. the very next mm-hmm. thing that you do. Mm-hmm. And it's nothing monumental, but you know, let's forget about a dropped pass or whatever. What's the next thing we're going to do to just keep moving forward? And it was all about developing these athletes. And he said that his wife said, these students these days aren't interested in being developed. They're interested in how much money they're going to make. Correct. Yeah. And that's, when you're young and impressionable and it's more about the money than, I mean, obviously, you know, you go to school because you want to get a good education, Mm -hmm. but also I believe that, that, um, education also teaches you critical thinking. Yes. So when you, when you steer away Mm -hmm. from that critical thinking, it becomes all about the dollar. What, what does that look like for our future generations where the biggest thing? Short changing them. Yeah. Is what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So thankfully at the division two level, which is where we're at, that's not happening because I visit with a lot of high school seniors and their parents. Like mm-hmm. I'll, I'll probably have two or three of those conversations a month, depending on the time of year. And often I always ask, are you a student athlete? What sport are you here for? So I'll talk a little bit about that. 40% of our undergrads are student athletes. So it's wow. a high number for us. And what I'll talk about is, you know, the odds of you going pro are like, we do have two former USF grads are in the NFL right now, so it could happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But the odds of that are really, really small. So the degree is what's going to be your life, right? So you're getting your business degree mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. majoring a minor in whatever part of business you want to be in. That's really what's going to set you up for success. I try to put that in their brains. Yeah. Um, but when you're 18, what do you know, right? I mean, who knows? You, just, you don't know if it sinks in. Mom and dad like that. They like to me to say that, right? Sure. Uh, but we talk about critical thinking all the time. Yeah. We, I'll, I talk about that in my classrooms all the time. We talk about that in faculty meetings. It's And, and we bring that up all the time. Think for yourself. Mm-hmm. Be an original thinker. Try to think of new ways to solve existing problems. That's how you're going to impact the world and things that you can do as a student and as a future business professional. And we try to really steer co- t- kids towards entrepreneurship and taking a risk and taking a chance. Nothing wrong with working for a business. Hey, that's yeah. it's what I've always done. But I talk to them about starting a new business, what that looks like, how you might go about doing that. And it's a risk, yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you're young, guess what you can do? You can take more risk when you're young. You know. So we talk about that a lot. Do you think that, I mean, now, now I'm going to shift gears a bit, <laughs> maybe semi-political, but yeah. when, when you look like, when we grew up in Vince 2, I'm still here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> in case Lou viewers are wondering, there. but like, sorry, Vince. You know, when I grew up, like we we had people who had various opinions, but there was a, a an unspoken code that you respected the White House, yes. you respected government, and then it feels like as we continue to go down this pathway, there is less critical thinking, and there's more of this mindset that we're this hive and it doesn't matter if you're red or blue whatever there's this mindset that well they say this i'm not going to question it i'm just going to adhere to it because i i like that narrative yeah whether it's good or bad and it just feels like the critical thinking in our country is kind of diminished i would agree totally agree with you it's sad is social media part of that that's what i wonder often all right, young guy, what do you think? Yeah. I think it's just the glut and access of information. I mean, sure. I have a 16-year-old brother, mm-hmm. and I ask him, he always asks me, you know, how do I do this? And I said, well, have you even tried yet? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, have you tried to figure out how to do it? He's like, well, no. Well, what was your plan? Well, I was going to ask you. Well, what if I wasn't here? <laughs> well, I'll ask mom and dad. Well, what if mom and dad wasn't here? Well, I don't know. It's like, and I'm looking at him like, what are you holding in your phone, hand, in, your, in your hand right now? My phone? Well, what does your phone do? Uh... <laughs> Google? <laughs> it's like they have more information now than we ever did. Absolutely. Ever. But because it's so easy to get to, 
it's the, the skills to find that information, the research that information just doesn't seem like it's quite there. And it goes back to the critical thinking. Yeah. How do you do something? Why do you do something? Yeah, that's, that, I think you're right. That's Absolutely. like your, your bit about the college athletes. It's like you go to school to get an education to get money. But if you shortchange the system and you just say, hey, come to school, get money. Why do I need to learn if I'm going to get money coming to school and playing? Yeah. Or yeah. if your athletic dreams blow up in smoke as soon as you get out of college, and now you've got to use that education and actually do something with it. We know so many athletes who just don't really apply themselves in college, and then they get out there, and they may make their pros, but they don't last very long. Correct. Well, and there's then a, they're out. There's even a set about pros who go broke after they... Were... Yeah, there's an ESPN 30 for 30 called Broke. That yeah. came out a while ago, early 2000s maybe. I don't remember exactly when. I've seen it a couple of times. And they talk about these guys who made mega millions of dollars and have absolutely nothing to show for it. Yeah. yeah. So so you can be you can make it big and completely blow all the money you made too. So. I don't know what his net worth is, but, again, I, I went to the school at the University of Missouri. Yep. And uh, Chase Daniel was one of the most storied quarterbacks to ever come out of Mizzou. And even though he uh, – he played for various teams. He's been a backup 95% of right. his career. Right. But, and I remember this, when they were talking about, he, he led us to a Big 8 championship back when we were the Big 8. I think we were Big 8. Maybe we were Big 12. And we lost to Oklahoma like we always do. But they would talk about how he had gained the friendship of people like Warren Buffett. Hmm. And so I would follow Chase from time to time. Who's he playing with? What's he doing? Yeah. And... Whenever I would read into the personal life, it was like he he was not buying, even though he's a backup, he was still making millions. He wasn't buying the biggest house. Mm. He was finding an apartment or whatever. Mm. And I think now he's like an ESPN analyst. But he has a, a company, he had an apparel company at that point in time. And just a smart, smart guy who could leverage his small frame as a quarterback mm. Still made millions of dollars. Yes, he did. I think he probably is one of the. I mean, when you look at the, the how long he was in there, the amount of money he made as a as a backup is astounding. But that, what he did with that money, he really put. And I think he he had a business background. He, he definitely put that to use to yeah. combine the two and walk away looking pretty good. Yeah, with no major injuries. I was going to say, being a backup quarterback in the NFL is not a bad gig. It's a dream. You don't have to get hit all yeah. the time. And yeah, you still make true. a few million per year. Yeah, it's not a well, bad gig. If you're a backup to like Patrick, exactly. I'm you're not going to play. Get a ring, get <laughs> yeah. paid. Exactly. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? You, you could be a backup to Patrick. And then every once in a while you go, hey guys, I'm still here. <laughs> exactly. And like, who are you? That was, today I feel like was, today, today yeah. I was backup QB today. <laughs> Well, it's it's great reminiscing with Absolutely. with so many memories yeah. that you brought out. I'm like, man, he's like a twin. <laughs> All right, Ben. So here's the uh, the wrapper up question. So we do have a, a point to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Besides just reminiscing about the days that I don't remember. <laughs> so Steve, um, as we wrap up our show, yeah, um, we really want to you know the theme of our show as you as you know is connecting that thread from the past, from our upbringing, from what kind of molded us to what we do today. And what we, so what, what have you got for us today? Is it a, a quote, a memory, a story, some sort of situation that you can paint for our audience that sure. you still use sure. to this day? Well, one thing I haven't really talked much about is a faith component to what we do and just um, using faith and your belief in, uh, uh, in Jesus as a, following, as a Christian. Um, to kind of center you and guide you. Um, I think that's something that I try to at least emulate. Um, and thankfully, I work for a uh, university that's faith-based where I can talk about that with my students. Um, but just that, and the golden rule is one to me. Um, you know, in business, um, I'm a big fan of business, following businesses, and businesses are people, right? Every business is a group of people who are trying to accomplish some common goal. In business, when I see people mistreat each other, um, the political stuff, uh, talking behind the back, mistreating, saying things, whatever. It always has really bothered me. And I always just think, would you treat your mother, brother, sister, just any family member the way you just treated that person, right? I always think about that. And I try to say that out loud to people sometimes. You know, would you treat that person um, that way, if that was your sister, if somebody, if your sister came home and said, this person did this to me, 
you might be upset about it. You just did that to this person, right? So the golden rule, I just try to, I, I'm not a deep theological thinker. <laughs> I will never pretend to be. But the golden rule, just treat others as you would want to be treated, right? Mm -hmm. That's such a simple thing. Um, and I think if more of us just live that out loud, just live that and say, I'm gonna treat you with respect because you deserve it. And I would want you to do the same thing to me. So if yeah. I have a disagreement with you, let's just talk about it, right? Just don't talk behind or back to other people about it. Let's just, let's just share it and talk about it. So that open, honest communication, it's, it's easy to say, right? I mean, it's easy to say, let's do that. Mm -hmm. It is hard to do in, in practice and reality. So what I try to talk with my students about a lot is um, just treat others the way you wanna be treated. That is a very biblical uh, foundational thing to think about. And if you have a problem with somebody, don't talk about it behind the back of others, right? Don't talk about them behind their back, deal with it. Mm -hmm. If you have to seek counsel with somebody and how to approach them, that's fine. That's, I mean, yeah, I get that. But I guess that's it right there. It's just be mindful of how we treat each other, right? Because we're, we're all under pressure. We live in a fallen world, right? But we can all do something to at least be some light and be some hope and treat mm -hmm. people with dignity and respect. And I try to do that. Am I perfect? No. Do I get emotional, upset about things? Absolutely, right? I mean, because I'm human. It's the way it works. Yeah. But I try to stay grounded, and I hopefully try, I try to give that model to my students the best that I possibly can, right? And hopefully they see that, they emulate that. Um, so that, I guess that's my takeaway right there. So what Steve's trying to say is when life deals you problems, pour some sugar on it. Yeah, call back. <laughs> and everything he learned, he learned at Kmart. Yeah. <laughs> or Jeff Leppard. I love it. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> All right, friends. Thank you so much for joining us today. To learn more about Steve and his program that he offers and the USF and anything else you might want to plug, you'll find about our show notes. Until next time, we'll see you guys on Nostalgia Street. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. If you're on iTunes, please take a moment and leave us a rating and review. Head on over to our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button. You'll get access to engaging visuals that complement our podcast content. Thanks again for tuning in, and we look forward to having you with us on our next episode. So until next time, listeners, stay curious, stay engaged, and never stop walking down Nostalgia Street.